Tonight you came to see a, a, a topic that I find very fascinating, and I know many of you feel the same way, um, is that it's on Frontier Forts, and we have the McBrides here. Um, Kim and Steve McBride are from Greenbrier County, so they are natives, so it would be very nice to them. Um, they went to Belliott College, and they have master's and doctoral degrees from the Good, the Good University in Michigan, Michigan State. Um, they have directed excavation on historic sites in the southeastern United States over the past 30 years. Kim is the co-director of the Kentucky Archaeological Survey at the University of Kentucky, and Steve is the director of interpretation and archaeology at Camp Nelson Civil War Heritage Park. He also conducts research and consulting through McBride's Preservation Services. They live in Lexington, Kentucky, but spend as much time as possible conducting their frontier research and visiting friends and family in the Greenbrier Valley. So without further ado, Jim and Steve McBride. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Steve McBride, and I'm going to talk first, and then Kim's going to talk later a little bit on some more um, detailed neighborhood level research we've been doing on the tours. Um, it's nice to be here in the library, uh, archives and library, because we've actually done a whole lot of our background research here, both looking at microfilm and uh, some of the, the files as well. Um, let's see how all this works. Uh, today we're going to talk about our research in the Greenbrier Valley on forts that date uh, from the Revolutionary War period. And a lot of this research has been sponsored actually by those guys that just walked in <laughs> uh, from the Summers County Historic Landmarks Commissions, uh, Steve Trail and Fred Long. Um, Oh, that's okay. <laughs> this map shows uh, the forts that we found documentation on, uh, which is uh, thir 31 fort. Um, we've done archaeological survey uh, for roughly, I don't know, about 12 or something like that, and then we've focused and done more intensive excavation uh, on four or five of these forts, uh, and we'll talk about four of those today. The Greenbrier Valley, um, during the Revolution, would have been Botetourt County, mostly down here, a teeny bit of Montgomery, and then Augusta up there, and then the counties got split up over time, so it involves going to a lot of different county courthouses, obviously. Uh, the settlement here by Europeans and uh, some Africans or African Americans as well that were brought as enslaved people started in the late 1740s uh, with a settlement promoted by the Greenbrier Land Company. Uh, this settlement was abandoned during the French and Indian War. Uh, there were a number of Indian attacks in 1755, and the whole area was really just abandoned. Uh, it was resettled uh, in 1760-61 by a small number of people, and then it was abandoned again after 1763 attacks, uh, particularly in the Muddy Creek area uh, and in the Great Levels is the area a little to the west of Lewisburg is called, uh, where the Clendenin settlement was destroyed. Uh, the third settlement period, which is the one we're interested in, started uh, in 1768-69 following uh, major land treaties with the Iroquois and the Cherokee. Uh, this was a treaty of uh, treaties of Fort Stanwix and hard labor. Of course, a lot of this land was claimed by other Indian groups, particularly Shawnee, that were not included in these treaties, and this caused trouble later on. Um, this research usually starts with uh, historic background research. Uh, Particularly the best period documents or close to period documents we found are the Revolutionary War pension applications. And most of those actually date from the 1830s when the, the men were quite elderly. Uh, a lot of letters and uh, some interviews are in what's called the Draper Manuscripts, which I believe they, I know they have here on microfilm uh, from the Wisconsin Historical Society. Uh, there's also uh, Usually, information that originates from oral history, 
this in early county histories and regional histories. Um, one thing of interest is we've also done a lot of research on some French and Indian War sites up on the Potomac drainage, um, in which we're not going to talk about today, but there's really better documentation on those because of George Washington. Thank you. Um, these records mention forts and they mention um, soldiers or militiamen and pensions being stationed at forts, but they really don't, except for a few rare occasions, they don't really describe what the forts look like, and they don't give real specific in, uh, uh, descriptions of where the forts were. There'll be things like, well, it's on Muddy Creek, or so-and-so, it's, it's near the mouth of Wolf Creek, or something like that. So it's really, uh, we have to do more detailed research to find them, and archaeology is really, in most cases, the only uh, data source that we can tell exactly what these forts look like and exactly where they're located. Um, the frontier defensive system that was in operation in the Revolutionary War, and also a lot of these forts started a few years before in what was called, or what's called today, Lord Dunmore's War, or Dunmore's War, which you, I'm sure, are familiar with. Uh, which culminated at the Battle of Point Pleasant in October 1774. Uh, and this started in the spring of 74, and some of these forts were built as early as that uh, in the spring of 1774, and then were continually or used again in the Revolutionary period. Uh, this defensive system consists of really three parts. Uh, the militia, which all uh, Almost all adult men of a certain age group were supposed to, uh, white men were supposed to be in the militia. Some African American men actually were too, uh, we found out uh, from documents. Um, and they would be it's sort of a quasi military organization. They would have musters a few times a year, do a little training. You were supposed to have your own arms. Uh, some of the militiamen would become what they called spies, we might call them scouts now, and these were uh, men that would usually roam around in groups of two or three uh, and look for signs that Indians were moving into the area. Uh, the trails were very well known to these settlers, and they would do a circuit around checking the trails to see if there was any signs that Indians were in the area. If there were signs, they would rush back to the forts and set off an alarm because a lot of times people weren't living in the forts. They would be living on their farms uh, and they really didn't want to go into the forts until they had to, until the alarm was set out. Uh, and this is why there were so many casualties in a lot of areas and the, and the Indian raids were pretty successful because they would sneak through and the spies might miss them and they would attack a number of these isolated uh, house sites, farmsteads, uh, which were more difficult to defend than a fort. Um, if they did hear the alarm, they would go into the fort. Uh, they may stay in the fort for a number of weeks if it was dangerous, or sometimes even the entire what they call raiding season, which was basically from April to October, maybe went into to November. Uh, and the forts, obviously, were the third part of this defensive uh, system. We have quotes in a number of, uh, these are from Revolutionary War pensions, and they talk about how this system worked. Uh, this guy, James Gilland, who was from uh, northern Greenbrier, southern Pocahontas County area, talks about how they go out of the fort and work each other's places uh, in terms, while some were working, others were watching and guarding. So basically, they help each other farm their, their fields while they were living in the forts. Um, the spy activities, here's a couple of quotes from Michael Swope, who lived on Wolf Creek in the Northwest now Monroe County. And he talks about going on this circuit from the different forts. He'd go from Cook's Fort to the New River to the mouth of the Bluestone to Van Bivers. This is in Summers County, then to Jarrett's, which is in Monroe County, making a distance of 30 to 35 miles. 
And then here he talks about when they do see signs of Indians, they fly from fort to fort and give the alarm so that preparations might be made for the people that were forted to uh, defend themselves and those who had ventured out to come back to the fort. So you get kind of an idea from these documents how this system worked. Another good resource are some, are some histories that were written mostly in the early 19th century by uh, people that maybe were children during the, the Indian Wars period, uh, or they uh, interviewed people that were alive during the time. And one of the, the good ones is uh, Reverend Joseph Doddridge's uh, history. And he has a, a nice couple of quotes that really emphasize how these forts were seen as almost like your personal property, like, and they were very much organized by a neighborhood. And that he'll talk about the families belonging to these forts were so attached to their farms. So again, people would go out to their farms and work them as long as they could, but they definitely belonged to a certain fort. It might be like Andrew Donnelly's fort, but the people in the Sinking Creek neighborhood, for instance, they, they would use that kind of terminology that they belonged to the fort. And then he also talks about how uh, when they were warned by the uh, spies, uh, the whole family were instantly in motion. All of this was done with the utmost dispatch and silence of death. Uh, thus it often happened that numerous families, again, belonging to a fort who were in the evening in their homes would be in their little fortress the next morning. Um, this again talks about living in the fort. Uh, this one, the whole summer season they spent at the fort and then in the winter they would go back to their cabin. Um, again, and this one talks about the same thing and again that they were um, farming in common while they were living in the fort. That's Gill land again, and then Samuel Gwynn uh, lived down in Summers County. Um, again, we don't have very many uh, descriptions of our forts in the Greenbrier Valley. The only one we have decent descriptions of is Fort Donnelly, and that's because Fort Donnelly was the scene of a major attack in May 1778. And because of this action, it just led to more writing about it. But there are some generic, sort of general descriptions of what these forts would look like. And this is one by Reverend uh, Doddridge. Talks about, you know, what you probably think of, you know, vertical stockades, either block houses or bastions in the corner. Uh, the larger forts might have cabins in them, sometimes making up a wall of the fort. Uh, in this man, Spencer Records, and this is from the Gregor Manuscripts, uh, he actually has a little sketch of kind of an idealized fort. Uh, and this one has a stockade with two stockaded bastions. And this is really kind of cool because we'll show you in a minute on Arbuckles and, and uh, Donnelly's fort, that's exactly what they look like. And this is a sketch from a Pennsylvania book uh, and this is the main type we think uh, our forts probably are with the, the vertical stockade. And you can think about what might be left archaeologically in a structure like this. If they dig a trench and they put the post in the trench and then fill it back in. Uh, at some point the post might rot or they might have been burned or they may just be yanked up what's going to be left there, because obviously none of these uh, the stockades are going to stand. Uh, from the documents also, it seems like even though they pretty much just call everything a fort, there are some differences that have major archaeological ramifications. The main ones are that some of the forts are residences, meaning someone lives there, that's their house, and it's a fort too. But there's other house, other forts, uh, that are not residences. They're just a militia-built fort. Uh, they're not at someone's house. Uh, they're probably only occupied the, by the militia and then these settlers that are looking for uh, safety during at most half the year and probably less than that. 
So these are going to actually have a lot less artifacts on them than these do. Also, one thing about these that's neat is that they're probably going to be abandoned when the Indian Wars are over with, the Indian White Wars are over with. While these might have an occupation that predated, say like they could have been built in the 1750s, uh, and then they may have been lived with much later, so they become more complicated for us. Uh, a lot of forts are probably stockaded, whether they're residential or not. Uh, most of the militia built forts are probably stockaded. Some of the private residential forts might have just been what we might think of as a blockhouse or a larger two story log structure that they just call a fort because it's stronger than the other houses and people might run there uh, in times of emergency. And in this neighborhood approach Kim's going to talk about a little bit, uh, we found that a lot of these neighborhoods tend to have two forts, and one of them is a larger stockade, and the other one is, the documents suggest they're small, or whether they were stockaded or not, we're not sure. Um, we've researched over 30 forts. We've actually been doing this since 1989. <laughs> So it's been quite a few years, I think, <laughs> uh, And actually, I was wrong. We, we've actually located about 20 forts, uh, more than I thought. Um, and of these, we've excavated a lot more on uh, five or six of these sites, and four of them I'm going to talk about, two of which we have actually the complete stockade figured out, which are Arbuckles or Keeney's Fort, and then Donnelly's Fort or Fort Donnelly. Uh, one for Jarrett's in Monroe County, we've got mostly figured out. And then another one in Pocahontas, uh, Warwick's. We've got some aspects of the fort figured out, but uh, it's been kind of hard on us to, to completely figure this one out, and I'll show you why. Uh, here's those four forts I'm going to talk about the archaeology on. Um, Arbuckles or Keeney's, it's got two names because it was built by Matthew Arbuckle in 1774, but it was on the property of John Keeney, and through most of the revolution from 1776 onward, it's referred to more as, as Keeney's Ford. Uh, William Warwick's Ford is in Greenbank, uh, Pocahontas County. Uh, Andrew Donnelly's Ford. Uh, and all, these two are militia non-residential forts. These two are residential forts, uh, but they're also a little different because Andrew Donnelly was the captain, later lieutenant colonel of the militia, later colonel, later <coughs> county lieutenant. So he was a very prominent settler and likely uh, his fort was built by his militia company, but it was at his house. Uh, and you can see from the dates, it's, the houses were probably built a few years earlier than, the, than they were fortified because when settlers came in in 1769 or 1770, it was pretty peaceful, uh, or 1771 in Donnelly's, uh, and they didn't really necessarily think they needed to fortify themselves. Uh, here's where these four are located. Um, one, Jarrett's in Monroe County, Donnelly's in Arbuckle's in um, Greenbrier. And actually, Kim's going to later talk about McCoy's Fort also in Greenbrier. These two are in the Sinking Creek area. And then Warwick's way up there near the headwaters of the Greenbrier River. Uh, Arbuckle's is on the confluence of Muddy and Mill Creek. A little bit above Alderson, if anyone is familiar with the Greenbrier County area, Alderson would be which is right on the Greenbrier River. Um, this site was pretty easy to locate. It has a monument right on top. <laughs> <laughs> when we first started this project, the first thing we did, besides archival research, was talk to the local historians, uh, people that had a lot of knowledge. And almost all counties have a few of these people. Uh, and we would go around in the car and they would show us where these sites were. Uh, a number of sites in 
Greenbrier County have these stone monuments that were put up in the 1920s. Um, but uh, they're mostly pretty accurate. Um, let's see. We started doing excavation there. Uh, like a lot of these sites, um, we'll start out basically trying to confirm that this is the right location. And what we have to do to confirm that is basically find period artifacts. And really the most common dateable artifact we find on these sites are rock nails. And we usually find those early with metal detectors because they're a lot they're faster than any other method. Another common artifact are, are busted up uh, cast iron kettles, uh, maybe like a two-prong fork, maybe some lead uh, musket ball fragments. And those are things that, that help us determine whether this is the correct location or not. Uh, there's other diagnostic artifacts like ceramics and maybe some bottle glass and gun flints. But those are usually things we don't necessarily find until we open up these larger excavations. Um, one thing we're always hoping to find is structural evidence of these forts, both in terms of buildings that might have been there, but also if they were stockaded, is there any evidence of the stockade? And at Arbuckles, we were quite lucky that the, first, the second uh, year we were there, we basically accidentally hit a stockade. Uh, in a test unit. And this is what stockades look like archaeologically. Here's a stretch of stockade. You can see this is the normal subsoil. Uh, and it's a trench that sometimes you can see individual posts. And sometimes it's just what we call model soil or spotty soil. And that's from, you know, when they backfill it, they throw the topsoil and the subsoil both together and it just gets mixed up. Um, when we excavate down into this, sometimes we'll find the bottom of posts. And those are kind of interesting because they were obviously green when they were put in and they sprouted roots. <laughs> we also, at Arbuckle, we found two gates. And you can see, can you see that gate there? That's what a gate would look like archaeologically. At the end of the stockade, there's larger posts and then a gap in between them. Um, and then sometimes we'll bisect these stockades to um, see how deep they are and, and understand more about their construction. So that's looking at one of the posts. This, the trench is actually this whole width, and that's one of the stockade posts itself. We also sometimes extract uh, wood remains out of there, usually if it's charred, and get people to identify those and determine what kind of uh, wood it was made out of. Um, once we found this stockade in a few test units, we actually got a, a little track hoe or backhoe out there to follow the stockade around. And this is a map of it. Uh, we first found it over here and followed the stockade over here. See this dark line? And we realized that we actually didn't find the main stockade. We just found an internal one because it teed right here. And then we followed this around, and we hit a bastion, which you can see right here. That's the north bastion. And then around, and found the south bastion as well. And these bastions were the main defensive points uh, of a fort. And they were where more people would be stationed. They were set up so you could cover your walls. Um, a lot of real academic forts have four bastions. But these forts are so small, this is about 110 to 120 feet on a side. You can easily fire down this wall from one bastion that way, and then this bastion can cover these two walls. It's called an infilating if you read any military. Uh, here's an aerial photograph of what the stockade looked like. This is Mill Creek right here. Muddy Creek would be. Um, to the north. Um, as I mentioned, we found this internal stockade, and we went ahead and we excavated that more with test units and found a little uh, bastion or redan uh, in that wall as well. 
We think that was really kind of a secondary line of defense. Um, we've also found evidence of buildings that were inside this fort. The main one <coughs> from this construction that was a blockhouse, and this is a, a computerized uh, reconstruction of that. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, the monument was built right on top of the chimney. You can see him up there in that picture. <laughs> So we never have been able to actually completely expose the chimney uh, or, the, or the monument would fall over. But uh, it's a very small structure with a very large chimney in it, uh, suggestion that may, the main habitation area was really on the second uh, story, um, which would make sense. We've also found a number of cellar features that probably were under buildings. Um, I don't know if you can see these, but it's a little darker soil here. And this is partly excavated out. That's one of our shovel probes. And that one's real easy to see. And this is kind of what we think Arbuckle Sport looked like. Uh, two bastion with a blockhouse, at least two or three other structures in it. This one actually is a blacksmith shop. We've got uh, definite artifactual evidence of a blacksmith shop in this area. Uh, you can see the two bastions and the two gates. Uh, this was the smaller gate, and that was the larger gate, or that was actually a water gate. It was on the Mill Creek side. Um, and Arbuckles, again, was a militia-built fort, occupied in 74, and maybe in 75, we're not sure, but then definitely in 76 through about 82. Uh, which the, the pension applications and the uh, Draper manuscript letters uh, talk about that. It would usually be occupied by uh, like a lieutenant's command or sergeant's command in the militia. So it would be maybe an officer or a non-commissioned officer and 15 to 30 men. And then families would come there too for protection. Uh, Donnelly's Fort, it's on a branch of Sinking Creek called Little Sinking Creek, or now called Raiders Run. Uh, it was, the house was built in 1771 by Andrew Donnelly. He was probably the maybe third or fourth richest man in uh, Greenbrier County and actually came up here and got involved in the Kanawha salt industry uh, right at the end of the Revolutionary War of 1780s, 90s, as did his son, Andrew Donovan, Jr. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was the scene of a large attack. Um, Native Americans' uh, documents suggest they were Wyandotte and uh, Mingo came from Ohio and laid siege to Fort Randolph. Uh, hoping to capture Fort Randolph, which was under the command of, of William McKee at that point. They were not successful in this, uh, and they decided to come uh, up the Kanawha and over into the Greenbrier and attack uh, Fort Donnelly, which they did. Anywhere from 50 to 200, depending on who you, who you read, uh, Native Americans. Um, this was an interesting site because we, we did some archaeology here and confirmed that this was the location of the site. It also, like Arbuckles, has a monument on it. But then one day, uh, oh gosh, I guess it was two or three or more years later, the owner, the farmer that owns it, uh, Mr. Johnson, called us and says, uh, our cows have uncovered some stones uh, in the snow right here. <laughs> So we rushed out there. We happened to be at home over Christmas, uh, or was it Thanksgiving? I can't remember. Christmas. And uncovered some of these stones and said, you know, we're going to come back in the spring and expose this whole uh, foundation. And we did. And it was a, a double hearth chimney with a large hearth on this side and a smaller on this side. And this was really important in figuring out Fort Donnelly because there's descriptions of it. And this one from John Stewart makes a lot of sense. It says, uh, the house composed one part of the front of the fort, it was double, meaning there were two structures side by side, which the chimney would support. 
the kitchen making one end of the house, and that's where Hammond and the Negro were, which was Dick Pointer. The firing of Hammond and Dick away from the people on the other end of the house, which was the main house. Um, there's the chimney here, and after archaeology, uh, this is the, the larger hearth opening, so this would be the kitchen where Dick Pointer and Philip Hammond were, and they fought off the initial attack uh, of the Indians. And then the men that were upstairs in the other half of the house were awakened and fought as well. But because of this description, we knew, we knew kind of about where the house was now, and because of the way the house made up the front of the fort, we figured the stockade intersected the house. So we came over here and started digging trenches. And sure enough, we encountered uh, the stockade actually right here. And then, like at our buckles, we got a little track hoe and started following it around. Here's Dave Dobbins, who volunteers for us all the time. He's kind of an archaeology hero to us. <laughs> uh, and here's a place where we bisected the stockade. Again, it looks very much like the one um, at Arbuckles. Um, we kept following it around and found a bastion. This is the south end bastion down here. And then kept going around and, and got one in the north end. I think you can probably pretty easily see that dark stand there where the stockade was. There's also isolated posts inside, too which were probably there to hold up the scaffolding where the militiamen would be stationed to shoot down. We know one man was actually killed at this bastion during the attack um, in 1778. We also found some other kind of cellar pit features. Uh, this is a large cellar that's right behind the house. And then these are two smaller pit features that we actually think might be privies that were in the corner that did not have a bastion. You can see the stockade right here. Um, let me go back for one second. And so, so far with our excavations, this is what this fort looks like. It's got two bastions like Arbuckles. It differs from Arbuckles and has a residential house that makes up one corner of the fort. So it, it kind of serves as almost a blockhouse over here. Um, and then it has, those were where those two pit features were. The house we demarcated by finding stone piers um, that the house sat upon. What's the dimensions? The fort is uh, 92 by, I can't remember, like 82, 84. That is smaller than uh, Arbuckle's Fort, which is about 110 or 20 feet on the side, and it's perfectly symmetrical while this one is not. These bastions are 10 feet square, exactly, and the house is about 36 or 38 feet long. It's a pretty good size. And it was two, the descriptions say that it was two stories and the men were upstairs sleeping uh, in this half. What happened during the attack is a man had gone out to get some wood, and he left this door open. And the Indians, the, the white dog, uh, decided they would rush that door and see if they could get in. Uh, and they didn't make it, because uh, Hammond and, and Dick Pointer uh, blockaded the door and fired at them. And then this awoke the other man who started firing it. And, and about not eight or not, no, about 17 um, of the Native American force were killed out in front here, uh, which was a tremendous loss uh, for them. Uh, Warwick's Ford, again, is near Green Bay on Deer Creek. Um, this location was pointed out to us by uh, the landowner uh, and another man uh, many years ago. And we confirmed with Mr. Detecting and some shovel probes that there were period artifacts. Uh, documents in the archaeology suggest that it was a militia fort, too. It, it didn't have the intensive occupations. Like Donnelly's house was occupied 
until about 1825. So we, we had a lot of artifacts up until that period. And actually, they built another house nearby that was occupied until about 1905. And so we actually had artifacts going into the 20th century, which makes things a lot more complicated. Uh, this one and our ruffles are very simple because there's some prehistoric occupation and then there's this very short circa 1774 to 82 occupation and that's it. So it's, it's really nice for us. Um, again, we were hoping, we, we confirmed that the site was the right period. Uh, we started doing more excavation there started finding more artifacts of the period as well as a lot of prehistoric artifacts. Um, and then we found, we actually used a soil auger. We started understanding what these features look like. Uh, this site had been cultivated like Arbuckles uh, and Donnelly. So you basically have about a one foot plow zone and then you have this yellowish subsoil. So, when you hit something in the soil core a foot down that's not yellow subsoil, you know there's something going on. Could be a rodent run or prehistoric pit, but in this case it was another stockade. And we came back and exposed that, and it was another bastion. Uh, but unlike Donnelly and Arbuckle, the stockade on this one just ends, which is really extremely aggravating. And we've been trying to find out where the rest of this fort is for a number of years, and we've got a pretty good idea of its limits by the artifacts, but uh, we haven't found any more uh, stockade features today. Uh, we have found a nice cellar feature. You can see it here with the entranceway right here. Uh, here it is bisected. You can see it stratigraphically with artifacts sticking out. Um, and this is right behind that bastion. It's probably under a blockhouse, much like Arbuckles. Though we don't have a stone foundation like we do at Arbuckles. But we have since this photograph come back and found a hearth area right here, a rectangular, real red burned area. Uh, it may have had, rather than stone, maybe a, a mud and stick kind of chimney that wouldn't leave too much archaeological remains. Here's a the map up until last season which does not have the burned area right here, but there's the bastion and the cellar pit. pit. And then some post molds. Uh, we did some track hose hoping to bisect another uh, bastion somewhere over here, but we failed. So we're still looking. But this pretty much is the extent of the artifact distribution, so we don't really think it's any bigger than this. Uh, We've also done on, on all these sites what is called a geophysical survey or uh, remote sensing using a number of different machines. This one's a soil conductivity. We've done soil resistivity and ground penetrating radar uh, and have found some anomalies, uh, architectural features. Um, but in the case of Warwick's board, it, it really uh, we did it after we'd done the track hose, so all those trenches <coughs> show up really nice. And there's the bastion there. And we, we found uh, the cellar pit shows up well, and also a number of other features uh, have showed up there as well, including the red burned area. The last fort I'm going to mention is Jarrett's, which is on Wolf Creek. Uh, this is David Jarrett's fort, which, like Donnelly's, was a residence. It was his house. Uh, this was a, the only fort in this group that we, we did not find it through talking to local informants. Uh, this fort seemed to have gotten forgotten for the most part. Uh, the others, the locals knew about where they were. Some of them had monuments. This one was kind of forgotten. So what we ended up having to do was uh, survey and deed research to figure out where uh, David Jarrett's land was, and this is his survey uh, with the different calls on him. If you've ever done uh, deed or survey research, it gets kind of complicated. Uh, you have to look at things like a steep bank crossing the creek, foot of hill, all blah, blah, blah. This one, fortunately, had this kind of funny shape, and we were able to fit it 
on this band in Wolf Creek, uh, and then we did we did a chain of title from the present landowner uh, and confirmed that was that was the location of it. So then we drove down there and uh, encountered the landowner, and I just walked up to him and said, "You're going to think I'm crazy, but." Uh, I would like to talk to you about a fort site. He invited me in, and we had a cup of coffee, and blah, blah, blah. And after about an hour, he finally, he said he'd never heard of Jarrett's Fort, but he said, Robert Gwynn told me there was a stronghold up there near the school bus, which is actually a deer stand. It might look like a school bus, but it's not. <laughs> and we went out there, and about five minutes with the metal detector, we confirmed that this was an 18th century uh, domestic site. Uh, and we've been digging there ever since. Um, found stockades. Uh, you're probably pretty sick of stockades now. Uh, also found evidence of Jared's house uh, in the form of a slime, uh, sandstone chimney uh, and then a limestone uh, lime cellar over there. Uh, this is a weird fort. Here's the stockade. It runs into the chimney, and then it's got a couple of pit features here and some isolated posts. And this seems to be what we think of as kind of an irregular settler fort. It, it's a little bit academic in that they have a bastion, but it's really irregular. Very, it's not like Donnelly's or uh, Arbuckle's. Um, and, Here's the two cellar pits, which we've excavated out. They're probably underneath some kind of outbuilding. Uh, and what we think may be going on with these post moles is that maybe they, they stockaded this side of the fort, which was the most vulnerable because the land rises up there. It goes down over here to the creek. Uh, but maybe what they did is they just built fences in between these uh, outbuildings and then in between the house. So it's kind of a conglomeration of a house, a two-room log house, uh, a stockade, and then some outbuildings connected by basically what are fences, not really stockades. And here's the four forts in comparison. Again, the two pretty nice academic forts, two bastion rectangles. Uh, a very irregular fort, uh, Jarrett's, and then kind of an unknown fort with Warwick's. It may turn out to be uh, more academic shape, but the fact that the stockade ending is rather mystifying. It may be that it turns into like a fence with posts six or ten feet apart. Maybe they run into buildings uh, that don't have foundation evidence. We're not really sure. Uh, I'll run through a few artifacts before I turn it over to Kim um, that we found at these sites. Uh, gun flints, these are all French. Some of them have turned into uh, strike lights. Um, this Liberty Seal or Cufflink we're really excited about because it, it reminds you that this is really part of the American Revolution. Uh, most of the Native Americans, or all the Native Americans that they were fighting were allied with the British uh, during the Revolution. Um, gun flints were very dear. The, the documents support this. And we have evidence of them making their own gun flints out of the local Hillsdale church. Uh, we also have evidence of African American occupation here. We have some uh, metal artifacts that have been turned into amulets or or lucky charms by putting marks in them. Uh, and a mark we found in a number of them are, are things that are, have also been found on slave quarter sites throughout the southeastern U.S. Uh, and people, anthropologists, have connected these uh, symbols to West African uh, spiritual beliefs, particularly the Bicongo cosmogram. Uh, we found a second one in our buckles. Those two are both uh, Arbuckle's core. And this was in a little pit, and it also had a broken knife blade in it, which is interesting. Uh, these would be things that people would wear to kind of ward off uh, evil spirits. Uh, Donnelly's Fort, uh, as I mentioned, it was a residence, and we have a lot more ceramics. 
than we have at these militia forts. As you might think about soldiers, they're probably not carrying around a lot of ceramics with them, or glassware. They're probably eating more off of wooden trenchers or metal, that pewter metal, more durable things. Uh, we do get some ceramics, but we've got a lot in the Middle East. Uh, some pearlware and creamware, a uh, redware, a uh, pewter spoon, uh, a big key. Uh, here's some artifacts from uh, Warwick's. Like our buckles, we've got a lot of arms artifacts, both gun flints and musket balls. Uh, the musket balls and gun flints suggest that they were mostly using uh, rifle size weapons. They were uh, 40 to 50 caliber. They weren't using the large smooth bore brown vests, uh, roughly 70 caliber or so. Uh, weapons that the army, the regular Continental Army or the British Army would use. Some other domestic things like Malpar, uh, thimble, which looks very much like the thimble today, uh, bottle glass. This is a real interesting artifact. It's a button that was molded to look like a Spanish coin. Uh, it, it basically, they used a coin to make a mold and Doing research on this, it actually is dated 1744, which would have been the date of the coin, but the 44, unfortunately, just fell off. So. <laughs> uh, but research indicated that this was, uh, like the Liberty Seal, a protest, and uh, they were protesting English money, and actually our money is based on Spanish money today. Our, our dollar is based on the Spanish dollar, which was uh, the doubloon or, or eight real. This was based, I believe, on a two real piece. So that's another indication of the revolution. Uh, we also have a, a side plate from a, a trade musket, uh, a, a bullet mold, and a really kind of fancy pair of cufflinks, which is kind of interesting. It's got little flower designs on them. Uh, and a, an interesting little teeny piece of glass about this big, which has lettering on it, and, and we were able to identify it as Robert Turlington's uh, Balsam of Life, which was a type of patent medicine, <laughs> which came from England, of course, uh, by the king's royal patent, uh, our enemy. Here's some Jarrett's. Like Donnelly's, there's more domestic artifacts, ceramics, uh, bottle glass. Another prominent artifact on all these sites is animal bone, which really helps us look at their diet. What were they eating? Uh, what kind of, especially uh, meat. We do have some seeds occasionally from plants, particularly if they get charred, but uh, we do get a lot of uh, animal bone. And they show that uh, on most of the sites, the, the number one uh, source of meat is pork, is pigs. Uh, and then second is deer. Uh, Warwick's is different. Maybe that's why Deer Creek's named Deer Creek, but it's got deer. It's the number one, and pork second. And then almost any other kind of critter you can think of, we've got. Uh, these excavations have always been seen as educational, and we use a lot of, uh, of students, particularly uh, college students, and many of them from Concord. Uh, that used to be Concord College when we started, but it's now a university. <laughs> and we try to use them every year. Um, but we also have used a lot of uh, public school students, uh, high school kids from Pocahontas out here at Warwick's, and then uh, doing a lab work with some, I guess, elementary school kids in Green Bay. And I'm going to turn it over to him. I think I left a couple, two, three minutes. <laughs> That's all right. You all are captive. <laughs> I'll put this down here. I'm short. I was going to say, it doesn't hurt that on the Warwick's Fort site, the landowner was the high school football and basketball coach. So whenever we needed a lot of dirt moved, we just uh, hollered and one of those teams came out. It was great. Um, we have, over the years of doing this research, you know, starting in the 18, starting in 1989, um, you know, we've always looked at a lot of primary records, to, but mostly we were really, to be honest, trying to find the sites initially. 
But the last couple of years, we've turned to back to a lot of those records to try and give us a more geographical neighborhood understanding of how the whole frontier defensive system worked. And I think, you know, part of that, there were little seeds planted for us when Doddridge told us that the people, you know, went to the forts that they belonged to, organized by their neighborhood. But as we got into this research, we found this really more and more uh, important. And I'm going to give an example of this neighborhood of Sinking Creek. And that is the drainage that Fort Donnelly, that Stephen talked about, is located in. But also another fort that we're very much um, working on now, although we haven't done a lot of archaeology there yet, McCoy's Fort. And I'll show you some pictures. And that's actually on the right in this slide. McCoy's Fort is just a, a very uh, unique treasure that we have, but we're we're afraid we're almost about to lose it. This um, two-story log structure that what you see here on the right is enclosed in the barn that you see on the left of this slide. And this is how we saw it when we first were told about this about uh, hmm, 2004, something like that, or three. Most of the fort sites are pretty well known and they're in a lot of primary records. McCoy's was not. Although, once we've been looking, it is in some records. But it was a local historian, a retired uh, high school teacher, who took us out there and showed us and said, there's a fort in this barn. And maybe because you couldn't see it, a lot of people didn't know about it. But the family tradition is that this log structure was built in 1769, so it's possibly the oldest standing structure in Greenbrier County. The barn that encloses it was built somewhat later, and we don't have a date for that. When the family built a new home up on the hill, um, they turned the original two-story log structure into a, more of a barn structure and then built the other barn around it. So what's happened is, <clears throat> leaning a little bit, I think when we first saw it, and then a couple years later, a tornado hit the barn and it destabilized it. And then what's happened more recently is those big storms that came through most of West Virginia in June, um, really, really, really <laughs> destabilize it. So it's still standing, we think. We're going there maybe tomorrow to take a, take a look, but it's very, very precarious. But it's you know quite a good resource. Now, we don't know too much about it, archaeology. When we could go in safely, um, we did a few shovel tests around it, and you can see in the lower right there, um, under about six inches of sheet manure, um, we have some nice strata preserved that does have 18th century artifacts in it. And it took just a little bit of poking around that what you see on the lower left is the chimney for that structure. And that chimney was very important for us to find because otherwise, you know, people could ask us, well, maybe this is just always built as a barn. But, you know, you don't usually have a chimney attached to the end of a barn. So finding that chimney was good. We hope to do more archaeology there soon. Um, there are plans uh, right now, some grants have been secured to take down the barn and then the two-story log structure is going to have to come down too. There's been openings cut into that to store hay and different things. They're going to have to replace a lot of logs. But the plan is to put it back and to have a roadside, uh, like a little kiosk, a pull-off. The landowner has donated land to be used. It's in Williamsburg area of Greenbrier County, so it's not on a main road, but you know, you have to, I guess, want to go there, to go there, but it will be part, hopefully, maybe of a driving tour at some point in the future for Frontier Forts. As Stephen mentioned, and I'll go quickly through this, the attack on Fort Donnelly is rare, but it's led to a much better understanding of that site, and also to some unusual documents. We have some lists of people that were in that structure, or men who sort of come to the uh, aid or the reputation of Andrew Donnelly. There's some kind of complicated things that um, happen. But one really interesting thing in doing that research and looking especially at these pension applications, we have learned that after that unsuccessful raid from the standpoint of the Native Americans, as Stephen mentioned, the 17 people killed was a terrible casualty for them. They broke up and some of them go to McCoy's Fort and attack that. And we have a pension application for that, that says they were repulsed, quote, with considerable loss. And there's no detail on whose loss, but because we've never heard of any of the settlers, 
being killed there in contrast to four people killed at Fort Donnelly. We assume it's Native American loss, but again, we don't have any more detail and we're still trying to find more things on that. But one of the things that we found in researching McCoy's fort is that William McCoy was not at, he was the builder, the leader um, of the McCoy area, the militia company. He wasn't there, he was at Fort Donnelly uh, for that attack. And so, you know, people were worried, I guess maybe they knew that this smaller group of Native Americans was going over to McCoy's. So William Hamilton and at least four men, possibly more from Rennick's Fort, which is in the Spring Creek area, not too far away, come down to the aid of McCoy's Fort. And in then doing that research, we find that lots of people were coming from other militia companies, you know, were coming to the aid of these two forts. Many of them didn't have to come all the way. They'd get word in the middle of their coming from somewhere in eastern, eastern across the mountains even, go back, you know, everything's okay. <clears throat> but this really helped us refine the idea of this neighborhood approach. And it's something, you know, that we had kind of always understood was organized by drainages back from years ago when we looked at a tithable list for Western Bonnetop County that was in the Fincastle Courthouse. And we noticed that these tithable lists, that's for uh, like a tax in a sense, um, for households, were organized by drainages. And of course in these karst areas, you sometimes don't have too many creeks, so you might have the great levels or the little levels. But when there are creeks, such as Howard's, Anthony's, you know, Indian Creek, whatever, these become the sort of organizing principle for this kind of early sense of government. And it's very interesting to look at the number of fords, and that's from our just basic research. We could be missing some. The tithables comes right from those documents. And it looks like if you get about nine or 10, you know, maybe 11 households, you have sort of a critical mass that you need a fort. You know, while there's so many more households for the great levels, there's just more people there. 38 households, you might say, for the, per fort. But um, you have some really big forts there too. We looked at the way that the militia companies change in structure over time. You know, and basically, you could say perhaps as the danger increases and also as population increases over time, from 1774 to 77, the trend is for there to be more and more militia companies. So seven in 74 up to 12 by 1781 to basically cover the same geographical area. And so we have pretty good records that tell us at least who was the captain for most of these companies. We don't know all the, the lesser officers for all of them. This is just a kind of a quick look at some of the kind of sources. We've looked at a lot of land records, tax records, besides these tithable uh, lists, tax records for seven, there's good lists for 1782 and 83. And a new source that I wanted to mention for folks doing you know, genealogy or military history is Fold 3, which is a new online source. It's kind of like uh, Ancestry.com, you do have to subscribe to it, but all kinds of military records are there, including lots of pension applications. And you can even, to some degree, search it, at least by name. So it's, this is really a wonderful source. We found a lot of new pensions. We used to have to go up to Washington, D.C., to the archives, which has its own pleasures. But, you know, and look through the microfilm reels, to look at these pensions, and now you just pull them up on the computer. So there's a lot more information out there. <clears throat> So what we've been doing is as we collect the information from a variety of data sources, we've been organizing it into a database uh, organized by household heads, typically. And so we have about 65 persons in this, or households represented in this database so far, where we're just trying to sort of put you know, all the information together. And this is for the Sinking Creek neighborhood, but we're starting to do it for Muddy Creek as well, which is the next neighborhood sort of over. But we had 31 households in 1775 and up to 42 by 1783. So it gives it, we're starting to get a sense of all the different contributions that not just the men, because a lot of these military records are pretty exclusively, you know, male, um, are contributing to the, the whole frontier defensive system. We've also, by using the tax records and land records, you know, get a sense that yes, these Fort builders are typically prominent people. They're typically, um, you know, what you might think of as community leaders. You know, one thing that the forts functioned as sort of like small towns, because at this period, say 1774, when a lot of these forts are built, there aren't many towns 
you know, in this region from a sort of central place perspective. The forts are the town. They're where the weddings take place often, community events, court often held, you know, in the forts. And so a fort typically, if it's going to be a house fort, it's going to be at the house of a fairly prominent person. For our little Sinking Creek neighborhood, Andrew Donnelly really stands out. And William McCoy is pretty wealthy, too. If you look, he's in the red, the second red line. He has 400 acres of land. The fort owner, Builder Mean, for all our forts, um, you know, it's pretty high in the 800s. But the Greenbrier County Mean, just 239. So you can see these fort builders really are typically prominent people. And here, if you look just at the concentration of wealth, the top 10% have 40% of the land, 28% of the horses, 36% of the cattle, and because Andrew Donnelly, 100% of the slaves in this area. And so this doesn't include Muddy Creek, but if we would, then I think we'd probably have some slaves, you know, up there in Arbuckles for, as suggested by the artifacts that we found there, showing an African American influence. If we looked at the land holding data compared to some areas further east, which had been longer settled, mostly because we have this data available from a wonderful geographical study by Robert Mitchell. But what we can see from that study for Augusta in Rockbridge County, comparing to Greenbrier and then to our just little chunk of Greenbrier Sinking Creek, is that we have, um, we have the green shows you people, the categories of landowners that we are kind of low in, and that's the low end people, one to 100 acres or 101 to 200 acres. And so it's showing you the relative youngness of our area of settlement. We've got a lot of these big speculators still kind of controlling a lot of the land, and it hasn't been broken up into smaller parcels yet and sold to individual, excuse me, settlers. <clears throat> but really, I think one of the most interesting things in doing this research has been that we can see that the, you know, the forts are central places or entrepots in geographical terms. The militia companies become units of local governance. The taxes are taken by the militia leaders. Um, oaths of allegiance, and this is just by going through the county order books and those kind of local level um, records. Constables, um, road work is organized, and this road work's pretty crucial in this early area to improve transportation. Is organized by the militia companies, and the roads often go from fort to fort. And again, because if you think of the forts as the forerunner of the towns, that would make sense as the places um, that you'd want to connect. And then how do we know this again? It's from these order books, buying out of the local area, and they're helping people go out and work their crops while they're confined to the forts. But they also are going further afield. Um, sometimes they seem hesitant to do that, or they only want to do that if somebody else is going to come in and protect the local local neighborhood. But we see men from Sinking Creek going to Fort Randolph, Fort Pitt, uh, Kentucky, Detroit, Southwest Virginia. So, you know, they are going out. But that's the militia is often seen as a very home-based defensive um, system. And in fact, they really didn't have to go very far, you know, unless if they didn't want to. And a lot of commanders would complain that the militia weren't a good army. You could never get them organized when you needed to, when the time was hot to strike, but you know, they weren't ready to go. Um, we'd like to know more about the sort of overall parameters of their service. We see from these pension applications that it was typically four to six months, sometimes multiple years of service, you know, primarily during that raiding season, but sometimes if they go further afield from home, that would take them longer. The pay is unclear. Many, many of these pension applications were rejected, which is kind of kind of interesting for these more western areas. We have a real gap in how they were supplied. Uh, we have the Matthews Trading Post for this area that shows some of the military leaders buying things like tallow hides and, and uh, bear skins. There's a typo there, bear skins for use at uh, Camp Union, but uh, you know, nothing for other sort of smaller militia supplies. We get the sense from the pension applications that, you know, of course the people are whining in these pension applications because they want a pension, but they pretty much often say we had to furnish everything ourselves. We weren't given powder, you know, we weren't given any supplies. <clears throat> uh, for our Sinking Creek area, we had one Militia man killed at the Battle of Point Pleasant. 
uh, as part of Lord Dunmore's war. And we can see that this was actually a major influence on our area, halfway sort of in between um, our fort sites. Let's see if I can use this without turning anything off. You see Cornstalk, halfway in between Fort Here, Fort Here, and that's named after you know Chief Cornstalk. And I was always told from local people in that area it was just named because people really sort of were in fear of him and, and sort of respected him as a, you know, as a military leader from a Native American perspective. The residents um, sometimes filed in later years to get recompensated for the things they had contributed to the defensive system. And here's a week, these are great records in uh, Richmond, Virginia. They were driving cattle, I guess often out to a fort site perhaps, guarding prisoners, loaning horses, for both short and long term use, providing rations for themselves if they were spies or rangers. And when they provided food to other people, they often called it diets. And they were supplying the forts with things like cornmeal, beef, mutton, venison, and flour. And we thought it was interesting, they didn't mention pork, but we find so much pork on the site. And then, of course, all the settlers were somewhat reluctantly at times, but you know, for the most part, at least if a really serious alarm was sent out, they would come and fort up. And I think we need to not forget that that was probably a pretty major inconvenience, although maybe it was a great social time to a certain extent, but these forts were small and people were crowded. And then we certainly have accounts in Kentucky where people there, the danger was so much really more extreme there that people typically had to fort the whole summer. There was no chance to go back and live at your cabin for periods. And they really complained about the awful sanitary conditions and the crowding, you know, being in these forts. So it probably wasn't really that much fun. You know, with, some of them are pretty small if you think about 90 feet on the side. So probably a lot of people are actually not living in the fort, but they're camping outside it. And then, they're, but they're just, you know, the fort's there that they can run into as soon as they need. <laughs> So I guess we're about finished, and we'll hopefully take some questions for a few moments. But we think this neighborhood focus has been useful to begin to, you know, move beyond just the structure itself of the forts and see how the whole system worked on a very local level. So we're going to add some more data from the next neighborhood over Muddy Creek and see, you know, how that works. There is hope for McCoy's Fort to go, as I mentioned, onto public interpretation. That'll probably be, they anticipate about a three year process to get all those logs taken down, replaced, and, and, and put back in place. But it's an important site, and we hope that happens. Um, I think we have, a, yeah, we want to say thanks to some people. You know, none of this would happen if these landowners weren't taking care of these sites. So in this particular ones we've talked about, it's the Sheets family, the Thompson Clay, Shea and Johnston families, but there's many, many more from other, you know, sites that we're not mentioning here, and all the students and people um, who have helped us. Um, as Stephen mentioned, Summers County Historic Landmarks Commission has been with this research from the very beginning, providing all kinds of support. And then a lot of the local historical societies, such as Greenbrier and Pocahontas, we started out with a survey planning grant from Culture and History, and we've had uh, grants from the West Virginia Humanities Council as well. So thanks to everyone, and we'd be happy to take a few questions. I know there's another talk starting, what, 7.30 or? Yeah, those who come regularly know so we don't usually have a reception. Well, hey. <laughs> um, I also will tell everybody that we have a few copies of a 2003 publication that these guys put together. It's a really good one. It's called Frontier Force in West Virginia, and it, I'll have it up here in the front. That's right. I think these are the last, these last, are the last, 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 last ones. ones. <laughs> Unless something's unearthed by another archaeologist. Uh, any questions? Can you name the Indian tribes that were the most raiding tribes that you think of? On the on the frontier here. Well, the the other than the Fort Donnelly attack, um, they're they're mostly Shawnee uh, were the main ones. At least uh, that's how they're described. Um, but sometimes, you know, they're probably mixed groups, and, and the settlers aren't necessarily all that great at distinguishing which is which. Like the the Donnelly attack, we know from Moravian missionaries particularly that they were Wyandotte and, and uh, Mingo, but 
some accounts say they were Shawnee, but and there may have been some Shawnee with them, I don't know, but they mostly were not. They came from Upper Sandusky, and they were under uh, Chief uh, Half, or War, War Leader Half the Half Team. But mostly seems to be Shawnee uh, from uh, the uh, early raids in the French and Indian War were Shawnee and, and Delaware, and, and then then mostly Shawnee, coming from like the Scioto Valley early in Ohio, and then they kind of gradually moved westward into the Miami Valley and west, but they were coming from Ohio down. Mostly young men, mostly led by Shawnee chiefs? Um, their names are usually not mentioned unless uh, you know, very rarely, like large-scale attacks like the one at Fort Henry or <coughs> Fort Donnelly or attack on Fort Boonesboro, you get the names of leaders, but usually they're really small parties, uh, probably 10, 20, no, no names are mentioned. We've done some research in the French and Indian War, and we have French documents and they'll mention a little more names of people, but the, the English, the, the British documents are, haven't been super helpful. I don't know. Is, is yeah. the Fort McCoy on the same side of Williamsburg as Fort Donnelly? No. It's on north. the other it's about side? A mile north. It's where? It's about a mile north. Okay, of north of okay. Yeah, and, and Donnelly. On the way to um, Hold On? No, well, yeah, sort of, sort of okay. but that, that way you go a little bit more west, northwest. Yeah, just straight north. Uh, it's like the second or third farm out before you get out of town on the main road. That road will just continue, and then it forks, and you can go to Cold Knob on right. the left and then go over to Frankfurt. Right, yeah, right. You know, yeah. And then Donnelly actually is over the ridge. In the, in the Raiders Run Valley, so it's a, a different okay. valley over what's, I think it's Brushy Ridge, it's called. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, where was Fort Randolph? Um, it was at the mouth of the Kanawha River. I think there's some people here that know more about it than I do. <laughs> yeah, it's in Mason County uh, at Point Pleasant, the town of Point Pleasant, but it's, I guess, to the East of the mouth of the river, I believe. I think the there's a monument. monument. The monument's there. I think it's to if you're looking at the river from the monument, it's to the right hand side. I think I've been told. And I think there's a housing complex on where that where that is. Am I right? Right. It's, it's a half a block. There's a plaque a half a block on the outside of the flood control, right there uh, between the, the two walls. There's a three or four little buildings right there, brick buildings, and it says that's where. Original Fort Randolph sat. Not a good candidate for archaeology. <laughs> no. We we dug some. Uh, I guess probably the Fort Ashby is the main one that are you know in towns and it's it's tough. But some we, we have successfully found you know features associated with the fort and you know under buildings, but it's it's just a lot more complicated and potentially expensive. <laughs> and there's a lot more late artifacts and we have to deal with those too. So that that went through the what, what the, the guns, the, the bullets that you're finding or that you you hope you found at Fort Donnelly. Uh-huh. Were from British, German or what are we don't know? know. We don't know. Um, they could have been low Pennsylvania made. That, you know, look, northeastern made rifles, like what we call Pennsylvania or Kentucky long rifles, is probably what a lot of them were. Uh, uh, we we found so few. The, the only gun parts we found was that one side plate and then a front. That was German. I don't. I, I think it might have been. I found some in a book that were similar, and then we found some front a front sight uh, that's out of 
German silver, they call it. And that's it. That's hard to say. I found German and British on French and Indian War sites that are identifiable. But uh, these are a little harder. But they, they have regular Virginia Regiment troops there who had military weapons, while these people had more hunting rifles. What they were. We were always told that um, um, John Stewart was living in the Frankfurt area. Mm -hmm. and he came to help defend Fort Donald. And I can't remember if he put that in his memoirs or not. Anyway. Right, he did. He, he was actually the commander of the biggest fort in the whole region, which was the Savannah Fort in Lewisburg. And they built that much larger than all the other forts because there were more population there. And um, you all probably know the story, but uh, McKee sent um, Philip Hammond, John so and so from Fort Prior, Randolph, Friar, right, from Fort Randolph to warn, to, to catch up with the Native Americans, pass them, mm -hmm. and warn the Greenbrier settlers. And they went to Donnelly, and Hammond stayed there, and Pryor uh, went over to Fort Savannah and warned them. Uh, and I think Donnelly may have sent someone else the next day. I can't remember exactly, but. Stewart and uh, actually the colonel of the militia, who was Samuel Lewis, Andrew Lewis's son, led 66 men from Fort Savannah to relieve Fort Donnelly uh, and arrived, I believe, in the afternoon uh, and sort of helped end the siege there. But Stewart was, Stewart and a number of other people came into Frankfurt. Uh, Actually, William Hamilton was one in Reading uh, in 1769 and settled there. And Stewart later moved over to what's now Davis Stewart Road. And you know, his house is still standing there. But he actually built a fort over in the Davis Stewart Road area. Uh, so by 1774 or so, he had moved away from Frankfurt. Yeah, but he, we're fortunate in Greenbrier County because John Stewart wrote a history. Um, and he, he's got a little memorandum in the, uh, I think, page one of the Deed First Deed book or court order book. But then uh, his son uh, published a, a memoir he wrote, I think it was probably circa in the 1820s that it was published. And it's real, I guess, you know, a, great document for us because it was a participant. You know. I've got a question about that corn. Uh-huh. Now you said they took the corn and made a mold out of it. Yeah, the button is actually brass. It's not a silver uh -huh. coin. It's not a real coin. Right. But it was made from corn. Correct. And it was, I said, it no, it was a it was a Spanish coin. It was just a Spanish two real piece. So it, it had a a castle on one side, and on the other side, it, it had a. It would have had a shield, but they only molded uh, the castle side of it. And it was, the was the Liberty's on a piece of glass. It's on a piece of glass. And it's backwards, you know. So we tried it with sealing wax, and it prints the word Liberty mm -hmm. you know, very nice. So we've not really been able to date it. Well, anyway, the coin had 17 blanks. Yeah. And you said the other part fell off. Right. And it was half. Um, because the, the condition of the coin, uh, it was in poor condition, and it actually, it's kind of brass, but it's kind of a, a, a poor quality, and it's almost like plated, and, and it has a thin uh, plating of brass, and when we were looking at it, the 44 just fell off. And that coin and, it, and other artifacts have been on display at various libraries in Pocahontas County, and the landowners been taking them to different events and things. So it wouldn't surprise me if next time we see it, the 17 might be, you know, gone also. Yeah. It's just we actually incredible. found a second coin button exactly like that one uh, in the cellar feature uh, later, like a year or two later. Um, but I did, we did research on, and they, they were like facsimile coin buttons or faux coin buttons, and there's some literature on them. Is, 
and it's being protested to, to British pounds and British shillings, and they would make these coins as kind of a political statement. It was, I, I believe, the denomination. It's, I think it's a two real, which is uh, well, like uh, a Spanish doubloon is. What is that? Eight, eight real, I guess. That's where we get a piece yeah. of eight and you know, a quarter. I mean, they used to actually cut these coins to make the change. <laughs> I think a two real is worth, it's either six and a quarter or twelve and a half cents. I can't remember. Either six and a quarter or twelve and a half. I have to look it up. At that time. At that time. Yeah. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. So, uh, Yeah, I think no, I think it's 25 cents. It's a lot. Because yeah. a, a piece of a quarter of a piece of eight is a quarter. And then they they, they, they cut them into four. But I mean they were making buttons Yeah, I don't know. It's a pretty it's, small button. It's probably could be on pants or maybe yeah. on a cuff. Yeah. It looks a little small. But they, small they could have made you know, multiple yeah. buttons out of one coin. Oh, sure. Yeah. You had, and you also had a cup Right. And were they made? They were all made out of brass, and they were solid brass. They were they were better condition. Yeah, and we found uh, that those had the flowers on them. Uh, a collector <coughs> found some in uh, Drennan's Fort in Pocahontas with uh, ships, three, three mass ships on them. Uh, they probably would have. Um, they Stanton. <laughs> Stanton would have yes. been um, the Matthew store, which was in uh, what's now Caldwell, was a branch of the Stanton store, which the George and Samson Matthews ran, and they have those accounts here on my, I believe. Uh, the uh, so they, it's possible that the Matthews brothers had them at their store in Caldwell, but they also could have, uh, you know, a real problem with these settlers was to go to the markets, they had to go overland because the rivers, once we got into Ohio drainage, the rivers went the wrong way. So they, they were basically going back to Stanton uh, or maybe Finn Castle, uh, and they would have to, um, you know, drive their animals or Take tobacco. Right. So it could have been at Stanton. Um, or it's possible that some, you know, there were some luxury items that were in the accounts. You know, mostly people are buying like textiles. And they would actually, they would value goods in the store by uh, tobacco and then ginseng. They were, because there was so little specie actual money around. And they would trade in deer skins.
you do have quite a bit of fired musket balls there. Who's fired them? I'm not sure. Is there a board that was not Yeah. Well, there's sports that we don't have any documentation. Jarrett's. Okay. Or Warwick's. Warwick's, we have no documentation. Probably a lot of the smaller courts, actually. Smaller neighborhood courts. Maybe we never had. Yeah. But they were worried during the Donnelly campaign, everyone was really scared. Uh, and uh, militia, as Kim said, were coming in actually from the valley, Shenandoah Valley to reinforce the Greenbrier. And like we know from some of the, one of the pensions that William Hamilton's militia were stationed in Hamilton's little fort, which is probably about the size of McCoy and Blue Sulphur. And he went down to Arbuckle because he didn't think he was safe at his little fort. So they were going. You know, some people were going to bigger forts, and then the McCoys asked for reinforcements to go up there because they were afraid they were going to get attacked, and they were. Yeah? I just that's an interesting observation. What you just said makes a lot of sense. We, think, we tend to think of the fort as the safe place, but it's the fort and the armaments of the fort that make it safe. That's why some of these small forts are right. coming to the other forts because they, they're thinking, we need to have more firepower. Right. Because the forts can fall. Right. They, they could fall. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these little forts, you know, I said Hamilton's company, but it probably wasn't his whole company because some of them were up at Renix. And it, uh, these little forts might have, you know, 10 guys. And if you go to a bigger fort, maybe there's going to be 30 of us, all with rifles. It's a lot better. <laughs> yeah. We know that ammunition was very scarce. There are some letters like writing the governor of Virginia say, if you don't send ammunition, we are abandoning the Greenbrier Valley. And then we get these gun plants that are just, you know, worn away to little nubs. That kind of makes the point. You know, way beyond what most people would use them. So. Yeah, lead and powder if they're meeting and flints. And, and I didn't really mention it, but archaeologically, the, the, the honey-colored flints are oftentimes really worn out. Uh, and they'll resharpen them. And then, you know, eventually, if there's one that has a lead patch on it, and it's worn because the patch was hitting the frizzle. And finally, they just, this ain't working anymore. <laughs> but these local flints that they're making out of the Hillsdale Church, they don't seem to resharpen them. They get a chip off of them, they just toss them. And, uh, and I've talked to people that do flintlocks and they say that that will spark, that the Hillsdale will spark pretty well, which is a critical factor with the flints. That, uh, it makes us, some of them don't spark as well as others. I've got a question about process. Um, you talked about the track towing, and obviously you don't want to, be, to obliterate things mm -hmm. while you're doing it, so I was just interested in some explanation about well, one of the most important things is, of course, to work with a very skilled operator. Many people that work heavy equipment can actually take off literally an inch at a time and keep it flat. And what we always request them to do, if possible, is to weld the plate across the teeth so they have, or something that slips on so you have a smooth surface and not those teeth. Um, you know, we tend to like to feel better about doing this on a site that's been plowed in all these sites that we did. So, you know, many times and then that dirt just gets moved to the side and then after we're through it gets pushed back. So, you know, you are certainly, if you could screen and dig all that by hand, you'd recover more information, but just in the efforts of time and to find that whole stockade, you know, we just sort of don't have the time to do it by hand. But, um, you know, just very, very slowly in the plow zone. Now, it's not to say you can't use heavy equipment on the unplowed yeah. site, but if it's not been plowed, you sort of hate to, you know, disturb how things might have positive. But it's, it's not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's working, it's not like when you think about somebody's digging a sewer line or something, they just take a little <laughs> chunk. You know, you, you know, you've got a person that knows what they're doing and they're just trying to take off like about, you know, an inch at a time. Or they may take off all the plowed soil, but they know about where that's going to end. You know, there's some work on your site before you bring in heavy equipment, so you know all the depth that you're going to We're always, we're right there with the shovel and the hard hat. We'll watch on their pocket. 
as I showed in the picture, it's pretty easy to distinguish the sun, this plow sun, which is a brown, loamy soil, from the yellow, silver clay subsoil and the stockade feature itself. So you just, like Kim said, don't be careful. You're just always watching them, and then you, you know, stop. <laughs> so they do a lot of, of they do a lot of sitting yeah. while you're and cleaning up. <laughs> so you also need a person with patience. But, uh, yeah, and then we okay. will, you know, use hand tools to clean it off or clean it up. So. I know Brian doesn't want me to ask this question, and sure, we don't have right. time to go into it totally. But we are in an ambiguous political situation, aren't we? With the proclamation line of 1763. And many of these forts being in a somewhat ambiguous uh, legal situation? Yeah, well, they, they, the, the, that's what the treaties, the, the British had the treaties of 1768, which uh, pushed, the Cherokee would push it, well, there's a funny line going from the lead mines up to the mouth of Kanawha, I believe. And then the Iroquois ceded all their land. Kentucky to uh, so this was a situation where the, the English we were still Great Britain then thought well these treaties are signed this is okay for us to go in here and then the Shawnee and Delaware some other groups that were not involved the, the Iroquois always said you know that they spoke for these others and uh, they said, hey, wait a second. <laughs> we, didn't no, sign. we didn't sign anything. You know, you, you all shouldn't go in here. And this is really kind of what led to uh, the Dunmore's War. And then, uh, um, then soon after the Revolution, I mean, you're right, it, the, they allied with the British. Uh, you know, they felt that West Virginia or parts of West Virginia and, and certainly Kentucky, uh, the bluegrass part of Kentucky, were not open for settlement by either of the Euro Americans. That's why this was disputed land and uh, really remained disputed land until. Uh, the Battle of Fallen Timbers and the Treaty of Greenville in 1794-95. So it was a long period from really the 1740s to the 90s that there was under the Especially in the eyes of militant Shawnee. Sure. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot, some Indian leaders and groups said, you know, let's let it go and move west. And others said no. And you know, there were there was disagreement. And, you know, like some of the Delaware uh, became Christian Moravians, and uh, it, it varies a lot. But uh, but the Shawnee had actually moved north from from much farther south right before that period. So they, they had, had moved been all over the place yeah. in the 17th century. I mean, they you know, were... In the 1720s or so. Some of them had gone east with the Delaware. Some had gone down to the south, which I think the Creeks or uh, that they were, yeah. you know, had gotten, they were really the traveling people. <laughs> but their oral tradition, if I'm not right, they said they were from the Ohio Valley They had moved along, they had settled in the Scioto Valley. Chillicothe was the head of Chillicothe Branch. They're, the social organization of these groups is complicated. We, we tend to lump them into, you know, this tribe or that tribe, and they have a chief and, and this chief, and it's very much more complicated. <laughs> we oftentimes would designate a certain person as a chief just so we could sign a treaty. Because all peoples have a leader, one leader, one political leader, and that's just not really true. <laughs> but if, if you get someone to sign a treaty, then uh, you, know. you get 
feel like you have the right to set up. But these groups would have, you know, war leaders and peace leaders and diplomatic leaders. Uh, and they weren't necessarily, and usually they were not the same people, person. It's whoever had to do that day. Well, depending on the political circumstance, you know, were you at war or were you at peace? Uh, were some a uh, committee from Washington or from wherever coming to make a treaty with you, those circumstances were different. 